Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us here for the second issue briefing of this day three of the World Economic Forum annual meeting 2018, 48th annual meeting. Those of you who don't know about issue briefings, this is where we try to digest um, in, in short, hopefully rapid fire, energetic 30 minute sessions some of the key issues facing our world. We've just come from a, a, a one session covering uh, the, you know, the prospects of a financial crisis. We'll be going later on today into the uh, prospects for financial apocalypse, a climate apocalypse rather. This is not the place you come to get cheered up, I have to say. But at the same time, we don't want to uh, give you too much of a dystopian future. There's plenty enough of that around. The reason we do these sessions, of course, is because there is a, there's a dual narrative going on at this year's annual meeting. There is, on one hand, you know, you know, a humming global economy, revving, revving away, and uh, we've seen from Christine Lagarde and the IMF uh, you know, increased uh, projections of global growth. But at the same time, as you may have read in the global uh, risk report that we published last week, and also in Mrs. Lagarde's comments on Monday, there are troubles lurking. And whether there's a financial crash or whether there's another systemic um, challenge facing the earth, uh, whether it's climate or, or, or any other reason, those prospects are still there. So we'd like to keep an eye on the, the risks that are presented to us. This particular session is about global security. In particular, what could trigger a major security crisis in 2018? Just to reinforce the fact we don't want one, but we have to kind of discuss these things. Very happy to be joined by an esteemed panel of experts. To my right, uh, Professor Li Guen, Professor of International Relations, Graduate School of International Studies, Vice President of Dean, Office of International Affairs at Seoul National University. To my left, uh, Professor Louise Richardson, Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, previously to that a, a political scientist specialising in the field of terrorism. And Moses Naeem, a distinguished fellow Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, USA, and distinguished writer and, and, and author. Um, let's start with Professor Lee, yourself. Um, and I'm, I'm doing that maybe in, in timeliness, but if, you, if one looks at the world right now and one thinks about the, uh, the security threats and challenges we face, the Korean Peninsula looks quite high up on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So what are the, um, what are the more likely prospects for a security crisis and, and ideally you know, what are the prospects for averting one in the Korean Peninsula mm -hmm. right now? It's very active, it's a very dynamic space, it's changing almost by the day. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, last year North Korea declared that uh, it has completed its nuclear uh, program. Uh, that means uh, they are going to freeze its further tests of, you know, missile uh, tests and uh, nuclear tests. But at the same time, we cannot believe 100% that North Korea has actually completed its nuclear program. But if that is true to a certain extent, then there is going to be a strategic stability and balance uh, on the Korean Peninsula between North Korea and, and the USA. And if, as long as there is a strategic stability or balance in the minds of the leaders of, of the nations over there, I think uh, the security situation in Northeast Asia will be temporarily quite stable. But uh, as uh, the, the title of this session uh, you know, tells, what would, could trigger a major strategic crisis in, in the Korean Peninsula, I think that would be uh, the miscommunication and uh, miscalculation and misperception, particularly uh, when the USA and North Korea are deciphering the signals rather than uh, directly you know, engaging in dialogues among the leaders or negotiators, it's going to be very, very uh, likely that uh, some of the leaders might uh, decipher the signals very wrongly. And, and also, uh, given uh, President Trump's uh, tendency to say something very interesting, uh, you know, using very dangerous rhetorics, there might be the exchange of, uh, you know, strange words like little rocket man or, you know, fire and fury, then that would again escalate the tension. Therefore, I think uh, the direct dialogue between the leaders uh, in Northeast Asia is one of the most effective means to avoid uh, the, the major crisis in Northeast Asia. And there's been a thawing there, clearly, in, uh, in, in, in this month, in the month mm -hmm. of January, and we have the Winter Olympics looming, and, and that could be a, a, it could be a catalyst for further, mm -hmm. for, further thawing of relations, or it could be a, it could be a, a ploy by North Korea to buy time or to, or to uh, divert the, uh, you know, the, the counterparts in the South. So there's, there's lots of moving parts still. And we yeah. have, as you say, you have the influence of President mm -hmm. Trump as well. What's your prognosis on, on the effectiveness of direct dialogue? We all think it's a good thing. Talk is good mm -hmm. as well as action. Mm -hmm. but, but how effective can it really be when you have uh, such divergent ideologies between these two countries? Mm -hmm. I think uh, to maintain the momentum of dialogue after the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic is very important. 
Uh, and at the same time, it's going to be very, very difficult to uh, maintain the momentum of dialogue because what North Korea wants is very, very different from what the USA and what South Korea want. Uh, therefore, in order to maintain the dialogue, uh, no, uh, not only North Korea, but also South Korea, USA, Japan, and China, we have to come up with a very clear uh, vision of the end state of the dialogue. Uh, that means we need to come up with a roadmap and we need to come up with a timetable and we need to come up with the end result, which can be mutually acceptable by North Korea and also by South Korea and the USA, as well as China. I was talking to a social media professor in London last week, um, mm -hmm. and one of the theories that he put forward was that President Trump often uses his tweets as a, a way of crowdsourcing and testing public opinion. Mm -hmm. do, you th do you think there's, uh, there is really fire and fury in those words, or, or do you think it's, uh, it's something which should be, could be downplayed in, in terms of severity? I, I do think that uh, President Trump's tweets and, and his words are uh, actually more uh, toward his own base uh, in the USA. And at the same time, nothing really uh, you know, serious happened after his words, uh, particularly after the, the fo uh, false alert uh, incident in Hawaii. Uh, it's going to be even more difficult for uh, President Trump to in fact, exploit uh, and, and deploy uh, the real uh, dangerous measures because a lot of people in Hawaii panicked, and I think a lot of people in Washington, D.C. And, and Los Angeles, they would also panic if there is going to be a, 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 a false alert. Uh, just to kind of just uh, reiterate the kind of the, the, the format of this session, we'll have a brief round of questions, and we'll jump in with questions from yourselves, mm -hmm. hopefully, and also encourage my esteemed panelists to disagree and interject at every opportunity. But let's just stay on this subject one more time, because I'm worried about these, these controls. You mentioned um, yourself the, the, you know, the, the, the uh, Hawaii control, that was human error was involved there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have missile defense systems being mm -hmm. installed. You know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right. and, and that right. wouldn't be too difficult for those to go wrong and to mm -hmm. maybe trigger something, to, something quite serious. Right. I, uh, I should say that North Korea has been deterred uh, quite effectively by uh, U.S.-South Korean alliance, as well as our uh, conventional and nuclear weapons. Uh, North Korea has been deterred for the uh, past century, and I, I think it's going to be deterred because they know that it's going to, uh, the, the chance of winning a war on the Korean Peninsula is, is zero. Uh, but people are not very comfortable uh, you know, seeing North Korea having nuclear weapons, so there is going to be a lot of pressure to bring in a uh, missile defense system. Uh, and, and at the same time, people is, is not very good at distinguishing between deterrence and defense. And if deterrence, uh, missile defense system is coming in uh, on the Korean Peninsula, then it's, it may disrupt uh, the strategic stability, not only between North Korea and the USA, but also between China and the USA. Then China is going to develop more nuclear weapons. Then it's going to give up, perhaps, uh, its minimum deterrence uh, strategy. Uh, then China would look very aggressive. And some of the hawkish people in the USA, uh, in Washington, D.C., they would say, see, China is going to be very aggressive. Then we are going to develop more weapons. So that is going to be a, there is going to be a spiral of you know, escalation of tension because of the missile defense system. So before we get further into this, this spiral, uh, let's wind. There's a very good point. You mentioned China as well. Uh, Moses, you wrote The End of Power in 2015. It seems like a long time ago, I imagine, for you now. Um, are you surprised at the speed at which the superpowers have, have declined and of the emergence of the uh, multipolar, or as, our, as Professor Schwab of the Forum calls a multi-conceptual world, has emerged? Yes, both things are happening. Uh, power continues to spread and decay and degrade, and uh, people can do less with the power that once uh, than before. But at the same time, you have countervailing forces of uh, institutions and individuals trying to retain, control, concentrate power in the business sector, in security, and in, in, in politics. So what we're witnessing in a lot of the security crisis we're going to witness is, is the clash between the forces that are spreading power, that are diluting it, that are fragmenting it, and the attempts of those who have power to retain it and to, to counter that. Um, one interesting example of that in, the, in, the, in terms of um, our conversation here has to do with cyber attacks. Um, in, um, a few years ago, Leon Panetta uh, in the United States was the Secretary of Defense, and he said that he was bracing, that the, the, the world should be bracing for what he called uh, uh, cyber 9-11, which is a massive cyber attack uh, that uh, had the, the kinds of consequences that the 9-11 had. 
And if you think about that, we have witnessed uh, a, a lot of these incipient cyber 9-11s. We have seen in, in the past years or, or so attacks. And, 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 and North Korea was behind one against Sony, uh, which was an interesting case. And we have seen others. Uh, but we have not seen the massive one uh, that uh, Leo Panetta uh, had anticipated, predicted, or worried about. And that is in the cards. That, that, that one should have that in mind uh, to, 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 when thinking about uh, security emergencies, accidents, threats in 2018. Why, why have we not seen um, such, such, a, such an attack of that scale? Yet. Yet. Do we have the capability? Is it, uh, what we have seen, and that has to do with the end of power, is the proliferation of new actors. It used to be in the past that the big weapons of uh, war were normally under the control of governments and armies. Now, if you think about what are the most uh, often used weapons in the 21st century, they are drones, cyber, and, uh, in, in, and suicidal terrorists. Uh, and uh, neither of these uh, depend on the, you, you, know, you, you can have individuals, so you, you don't need nation states. They are not un necessarily under the control of nation states. Uh, so it, it is a change in which uh, uh, the power to conduct war or having the weapons of war uh, has shifted from militaries and governments to organizations and individuals even. Which brings us perfectly, uh, Professor Richardson, to your expertise in, in terror, uh, to answer maybe a question whether threats from, from within societies are, are now more, um, more likely to lead to a global security crisis than those between states. Well, I think it's really the biggest uh, threat is likely to come from the interaction between the external and the internal. And um, in, in a venue like this, uh, and a setting like this, one is inclined to think of, of high-tech problems, not to for a moment to uh, suggest that cyber attack, major cyber attack is impossible, or major state conflict. But actually, it's important to think about the much easier and I would argue more likely low-tech uh, attacks. So imagine what might happen, and it's eminently conceivable, if one were to have in a, um, a Western country, say half a dozen small-scale attacks in sporting venues, shopping malls, whatever, simultaneously. And then the same again a week later or two weeks later. Um, and there you'd have a leader whose uh, first responsibility to protect the population um, he, he was unable to fulfill and therefore weak. You would have, especially in this age of populism, an aroused population demanding a reaction. So let's imagine it turned out that one or two of these perpetrators shared a nationality. It was found that they were from a particular country. There would be enormous pressure and in some instances a desire to react um, against that state. Um, the whole genius of terrorism is that it is designed to provoke a, an overreaction and most countries oblige by overreacting. So one could imagine then a country overreacting against a state which they believed was responsible for all these attacks. And in fact, as uh, we've just heard, often the state doesn't orchestrate these attacks. Um, and that, so that you'd have an escalating, they would overreact, the state would see this as an act of war, and that would, given especially in an environment in which the infrastructure of diplomacy has been degraded over the past couple of years, um, that's more likely outcome fewer um, quite a few inexperienced leaders and a degraded diplomatic infrastructure, you could easily see a situation deteriorating or indeed escalating. A quick show of hands, who wants to ask questions? Okay, let me, let me continue. I have a few. Gather your thoughts. Um, let's move on to some other parts of the world. Venezuela, for, for, for example, we're seeing a de deterioration in the news right now. Moses, it's a, you know, from your part of the world. What, what's your take on that situation? Venezuela is going, in 2018, Venezuela is going to provide one of, uh, some of the most harrowing headlines in, in that you're going to see in the, in the news. Venezuela is undergoing a, a massive, massive humanitarian crisis that is going to get worse. We also uh, will see a major displacement of, in, of people. Four million people have already left uh, uh, in, from Venezuela, as estimated. 
And this year uh, is going to continue. This is a country that cannot feed itself, the, the, cannot feed its, popu its population. It doesn't have the resources to import food. It doesn't have the, 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 the domestic capacity to, to, to produce uh, food um, has been devastated. And so we are going to see um, a, a country going uh, uh, starving and desperate people walking or finding any way possible to, to, to leave the country in search of food. Um, and and we, were, that, we will see a crisis in Venezuela, the likes that we had never seen in the Western Hemisphere, not even in Haiti. Which brings me to mind of, of other areas of the world which are you know, perhaps under, underplayed. But when I was thinking more about Asia and the, you know, the ethnic cleansing, as the UN describes, what's going on in, in, in Myanmar, we're seeing, we're seeing Buddhism and Muslim nationalism emerge as well as a great global threat. And, and, and what do we think the impact of, of, of these movements, of the mobilization of, of, of groups of people, whether it's via religion or whether it's via any other a class or any, any other collection, and what kind of impact they could have in terms of spilling over and causing a wider, wider catastrophe. One of the perplexities and difficulties of our time is how there is consensus on what to do and inability to do it uh, in a variety of areas, uh, from climate change to, to, to refugees to containing war uh, uh, and so on. So the number of problems that require collective action, meaning more than one country acting together, that the requirement for that, the demand for that is mounting. Uh, the, the supply the, of, for that, the, the response, the, the, the capacity of the world's institutions uh, to, to, to act effectively in a coordinated, multilateral way is either stagnant, stagnant or, or, or declining. That deficit between uh, a soaring demand for collective action internationally and a stagnant capacity to respond creates one of the most dangerous uh, deficits of our times. In economics, that kind of deficit creates inflation when you have a lot of demand and no supply, result is inflation. In geopolitics and security, that kind of uh, deficit creates a lot of victims. How do you create, and this is maybe an, uh, too obvious a question, but how do you create that, that supply? How do you improve the, the ability to, to cooperate? Of course, it's the theme of this meeting. Of course, it's not as easy as, uh, as getting people around a table, but what are the prospects for, for, for that happening? It's issue specific, it depends. Uh, uh, what we have seen is that the most uh, effective reaction is to move from multilateralism, in which you expect 180 countries to agree in a like of a Paris-like uh, environmental deal, and moving from that to minilateralism, not multilateralism, minilateralism, just the minimum amount of countries and minimum number of countries that you need to make a dent on the problem. Perhaps not solve it, but uh, put in a room you know, the number of countries that, uh, that have a say uh, in the problem, that are a cause of the problem, or that can help with the solution. And try to keep it small and try to make them work together. That is a far more effective, pragmatic way of acting than just hoping for the very large multilateral efforts that, that involve uh, hundreds of governments. And so just as we say, sorry, Professor, Professor Gwen. I, I was going to uh, add that, uh, in, particularly in the area of security affairs, uh, one of the uh, dangers is that people do not really listen to experts and elites. They have their own opinions, always. So uh, you know, it's very difficult to persuade uh, the people. And as long as people do not listen to the ideas of experts who can come up with uh, the most effective solutions, it's very, very difficult to make them cooperate with others. Not only uh, within uh, the nation to cooperate with the government, but also to cooperate with other governments as well. Desmond here has got a question. Can you get a microphone, please? Sir, could you let us know your name and where you're from? Uh, Johan Aurich, I'm uh, based in uh, London. Can the panel comment on the European theatre? Perhaps we're not, we're not used to thinking security issues in Europe, but there are increasingly signs. There's an election in Russia. Uh, the a UK general uh, recently commented on that. Maybe you've, uh, you've followed that. Uh, NATO is certainly not becoming stronger. Uh, doubt is being uh, thrown in. Uh, is this a long-term issue, perhaps? Or is this even have the possibility for something short-term? Who wants to take that one? Louise, you're based in Europe. You're a European. <laughs> um, 
It's, it's, I, it's not one of the things that I worry most about. Uh, I have to say, yes, NATO is becoming weaker. Yes, we have had um, uh, unusually British generals criticizing a conservative government for not funding the military uh, adequately. I see that as more of a reflection of the fragility of British politics at the moment than, than anything else. Military, of course, always want more funding. Um, and part of the argument of the military actually is that the funding is, and this is a real issue for Britain, whether the funding reflects the changing uh, security realities. Um, in, in the case of Britain, the Trident is enormously expensive. Uh, it's not uh, going to be of enormous use to most uh, security scenarios in, in which Britain is likely to find itself. So I, I, I see that at more as the issue. So the, Europe as itself, where there's likely to be conflict, it's much more likely to be as a result of uh, terrorist attacks and overreaction to them, or uh, social dislocation caused by mass migration, that, uh, um, rather than, uh, I don't perceive, but who knows, um, a, a military threat there from, from the east. How about a breakup of the, of, of the multilateral institutions such as NATO? We've seen the WTO kind of creaking, um, um, Secretary, uh, uh, Mnuchin this morning in the media briefing uh, talked about how on a panel uh, the Director General of the WTO acknowledged there needed to be a rebalancing. So we're seeing multilateral institutions creaking and coming under pressure, maybe something like NATO as well, and maybe Turkey could leave or another country could leave or it could collapse. Well, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, before President Trump was elected uh, and before um, NATO was in a very, very bad shape in terms of uh, support and enthusiasm uh, for it. But uh, Putin, who hates NATO, did NATO a, a wonderful favor, uh, you know, as a result of uh, what happened in Crimea and what's happening in Ukraine and all that. Uh, it showed that th there is a need for an organization like NATO and uh, perhaps an unintended consequence of uh, the Crimea takeover, uh, the Crimea grab, and, and the, the, the Ukrainian situation is that uh, uh, it, it gave uh, uh, NATO a, sec a second wind. Um, and, it, um, and then there was the election of President Trump, who clearly started by, by saying that you know, he had no use for, for NATO and all that. But it's very interesting to see how his position has been softening on that. Could I just comment on, on Turkey, though? Um, I mean, one could argue that NATO would be stronger if Turkey were to leave. If, if, if we want to have popular uh, support for multilateral institutions, the multilateral institutions must be seen to abide by the principles they espouse. And when a country behaves as Turkey has, and when a government uh, like the Erdogan government behaves as it does, um, I'm not very comfortable being a, a party to uh, the behavior of a, a state like that, and, and yet, we're wedded to, to, to Turkey and it's some of its appalling behavior by virtue of, of shared membership of NATO. I've got a whole list of questions I'd like to ask, but first of all, gentlemen in the front row, um, wait for the mic, please give us your name and tell us where you're from, who you represent. Uh, Pickers Goldschmidt, I'm the president of the Conference of European Rabbis. Um, uh, following uh, on your question, if push comes to shove and Russia would attack the Baltic countries, would NATO come through or not? Question number two, would, um, um, would this, uh, the EU new strategic uh, defense uh, alliance replace or whatever, whatever the EU is doing internally in terms of uh, aligning its uh, outside borders? And uh, they've done in terms of security much more in the last two years than they've done the 40 years before. Would this eventually replace NATO? Suburbs of St. Petersburg, I believe they were once referred to somebody quite well known. The Baltic states, how safe are they? So, um, that's a conversation that, that nobody, that's a question that no one has an answer. No one can guarantee you that uh, um, if Russia uh, attacks, uh, NATO will come through. That's the hope, that's the design, that's the stated policy, that's, uh, that's what I hope it happens. But uh, I'm not sure that there's a 100% guarantee that uh, that will happen. Um, and I don't think you will find anyone can, can give you that guarantee or can be sure of that. Um, as for the, what you call the, the new security arrangements in Europe, 
those have a lot to do with border fortifying borders. To, to they have to do. There are more national guard pol police kind of immigration po policies uh, that are armed forces policies. You you have not seen uh, a lot of uh, redeployment of uh, you know, weapons acquisitions or uh, major military redeployments as a result of that. You have seen efforts to fortify borders to make them uh, harder, uh, but not in a massive military way. And the, uh, the European Strategic Defence Alliance and its prospects? I think Louis Louise, knows more. Louise, do you have any, anything to add to that? Well, we, we just haven't seen any evidence that European governments are willing to commit the kind of resources that would be necessary to build uh, economic resources, to build uh, a realistic um, uh, substitute for NATO. I mean, um, far be it for me to uh, agree uh, with President Trump on much of anything, but actually we all know that the Europeans have been free riding on the Americans throughout the post-war period. Um, when it comes to supporting NATO, and they haven't been willing to even meet their, their, their stated commitments, much less significantly increase them. But it's difficult, isn't it? We talk about the need for greater cooperation, probably bigger budgets, and yet the demands on, on, on resources are, are so acute when you have to reskill for the fourth industrial revolution, you have to find green growth to replace uh, you know, our kind of legacy infrastructure. It, it's difficult. So we're looking at a diffused set of threat, threats now from a wider range of people, less resources to cope. It sounds, sounds quite, quite difficult. Um, moving back to the, the terror um, yeah, field, are we winning the war on terror? We've seen ISIS in decline over the past, um, past 18 months, at least territorially. Uh, but what is, that, what is that dynamic and how is it changing? Well, first of all, um, terror is an emotion, so one can't sensibly wage war on an emotion. Um, terrorism is a tactic, and um, again, I don't think one can sensibly wage war on a tactic. Uh, a tactic would be used as long as it uh, proves effective. And terrorism, uh, historically, and particularly recently, has proven enormously uh, effective in, in achieving certain goals. It has proved singularly unsuccessful in achieving the uh, broad political change that um, many terrorist groups uh, aspire to achieve, but they have been extremely successful in achieving near-term goals. Uh, for example, exacting revenge on uh, the states that they believe have um, committed atrocities against them. They have been extremely successful in promoting uh, overreaction by states and thereby demonstrating their importance. And they have proven very successful in, in gaining renown and glory for themselves and their cause. So they haven't affected political uh, 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 change in the sense of acquiring um, uh, statehood or in the case of ISIS. I mean, ISIS's uh, brief strength was its greatest weakness, is the fact that it actually did control territory, unlike most terrorist groups. Uh, that was an enormous strength for a short period of time because it proved a, such a magnet for recruiting uh, disaffected people from all over the world to join in the war that appeared to be winning. But it was also, of course, its greatest weakness because uh, as soon as it had a, a space, the conventional armies w w were always going to be able to uh, defeat them. So the whole concept of a war on terrorism, I think, is, is a mistaken one. And the, I think what we should be trying to do is address the political, the underlying causes that cause people to resort to terror. And, and that the most we can aspire to do is contain the threat from groups who are, who are prepared to use terrorist tactics. But a war on terrorism, I think, is just a silly concept. What would happen in, part of my mind back to 2001, when the, uh, the Washington consensus was hegemonic, um, global cooperation and, and trade were, were, were kind of you know, growing away quite nicely, and things were okay, and then 9-11 happened, and we're in a different world today. What about one of, one of a super events, such as 9-11? If it happened today, why, why the, in the US, or maybe in Beijing, or another major center, how would we cope? What would the, uh, what would the reaction be? Well, if you look at, <laughs> historically, the reaction has always been the same. Uh, well, in, 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 I'm, I'm just talking about countries, which is to say the immediate response is uh, a draconian one, and when liberal democracies forget their commitment to human rights um, and civil rights and all the things that liberal democracies espouse, um, and then that's the immediate reaction, and then there tends to be, uh, after a space of time, some more considered uh, approach to say, is this, 
uh, is this the right approach or not? And eventually you get to a more reasoned counterterrorism policy. So the iron law of counterterrorism policy, I think, if you look historically, is that it, it improves with time. Uh, but the second uh, iron law is that countries never learn from uh, the experience of other countries. They do learn from their own. So one would love to think that if there were a 9-11 event in another country, other countries would learn from the American experience and not respond as America did. Uh, odds are they wouldn't. Um, odds are they would repeat the American mistakes, just as America repeated the mistakes of the British military in Northern Ireland. American policy, I think, is much more sophisticated, much wiser now than it was because they've learned, as, as indeed British policy before it and so on. Um, but sadly, there, as I say this as an educator, um, the willingness of people to learn from other mistakes, the willingness of governments to learn from other mistakes um, is, is, is staggeringly low. Time marches on, and we do need to respect time, I'm afraid, because we're all busy on this third day. Before we leave, the Global Risk Report, um, published last, uh, last week, and apologies for the over-branding, uh, but the majority of experts polled in this, in this report uh, suggested and believed that the prospects for war between a major, major power was greater in 2018 than it was in 2017. Do you all agree? That's my final question to you. Yes or no? No from, mm. from Professor Lee. I'm an academic. I don't go for yes and no's. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith once said there's two kind of forecasters, mm. ones who don't know and ones who know they don't know, and I know I don't know. I was going to answer, but after that, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> 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 you <laughs> I, and I, I don't believe, I, I, I believe that uh, he's not, he's, I, I share his view. That's a relief. Thank you very much. It's, um, I, feel, I, feel, I feel it's covered a lot of ground and, and I feel heartened by, uh, by the contributions you've all made. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you for joining us here. Thank you for watching live online. This is now over. Thank you. Thank you.